Welcome to our special revision webinar on market structures in the long run. So when we're thinking about market performance, we, we tend to focus on, on several key aspects. Performance, of course, relates to the actual conduct and behavior of businesses. What are the outcomes for both uh, consumers, for businesses, for governments and for other stakeholders? So here are some key features of market performance. We, we focus, for example, initially on the trend in the real price level for consumers, how many people can afford to buy the product over time. We look, for example, at the profitability of suppliers in the market. Is there evidence, perhaps, of excess monopoly profit being made? We also look in a dynamic sense at how much innovation there is at the cutting edge, how much spending businesses are, are putting into the market on research and development. We focus on efficiency issues, such as unit labour costs and trend changes in labour productivity. And of course, increasingly, we have a view on environmental indicators. Are businesses in the market making progress in cutting, for example, the carbon intensity of their, of their output? The crucial question when we think about market structures, I think from an exam point of view, is whether the actual conduct, the actual behaviour of businesses gives rise to efficient outcomes. And here we can think about four particular types of efficiency, allocative efficiency, Prices, for example, relative to the marginal cost of supply, productive efficiency, what's happening to the average or the unit cost of production, both in the short and the long run. Dynamic efficiency is also important. The pace of innovation, the quality of product, performance, the range of choice. And increasingly, of course, social efficiency, to what extent is the market mechanism taking into account externality effects. There are different types of efficiency. Uh, if you're interested in revising these things at this moment, there are separate topics on each on our YouTube channel. But maybe press the pause button and, and drop down some key definitions here. So it's important in a level economic answers on market structures to bring in to bring in the concept of economic efficiency in different different ways. We'll come back to these uh, in each of these little sections of this video. So perfect competition at one extreme of the market structures. Here's the shortened diagram, uh, necessarily a shortened diagram of a firm that's making super normal returns in the short run equilibrium. The market price is P1 and that price is sufficient for the firm and output Q1 on the right hand side to make a, a super normal return. But of course we're focusing in this session on long run in market structures and in the long run then what tends to happen <coughs> if firms are making super normal profits is that new firms come into the market that causes an outward shift of market supply. And the market price tends to fall until a new equilibrium is reached at normal profit, where price equals average cost. And that's at output Q2 in our diagram here. Now, this equilibrium is just enough, it allows firms to make just enough profit to keep resources in their current use. And that tends to be the fairly static idea of equilibrium in a perfectly competitive market. We think about economic efficiency in this industry, then perfect competition is excellent for allocative efficiency. The price equals the marginal cost in short and long run. Uh, we achieve a Pareto optimal allocation of resources. It's also very good for productive efficiency because at the output Q2, output is supplied at minimum average cost. Um, firms are at the lowest point of their average cost curve, so they're ex-efficient. But perfect competition is not necessarily as good as other market structures for dynamic efficiency. We assume the, the products supplied to the market are homogenous, they're standardised, and that means there's relatively little scope for innovation, which one firm can benefit from without other firms immediately getting the spillover effects. So perfect competition is ex excellent, outstanding for allocative and productive efficiency, less so for dynamic. Monopolistic competition is a close close neighbour of perfect competition. Here we have many, many firms, no barriers to entry of any significance, but each firm in this case is producing a slightly differentiated product or service. So typically, you know, many, many dry cleaners or laundrettes or hairdressing salons in a particular town, offering a differentiated product in some sense. Now, in monopolistic competition, firms can earn any level of profit in the short run, in this case, our firm is operating an output Q1 and is making super normal profits because the price is greater than average cost. But we're focusing in this session on the long run and in the long run equilibrium, new products, new firms come into the market if super normal profits are being made. So the long run equilibrium tends to be here where the average revenue curve, drawn is highly elastic, reflecting the large number of closed substitutes in the market. 
where the average revenue is tangential to average cost. At output level Q2, and price P2, price equals average cost, and only normal profits are being made. Now, what does this mean for economic efficiency? Well, in, in monopolistic competition, we don't get allocative efficiency. As we go back to our diagram here, price P2 is still above the marginal cost of supply, so it's not allocatively efficient. But it's not it's not far off, and the number of closed substitutes mean that pricing power of firms is limited. However, the crucial point, I think, from a point of view of efficiency is productive efficiency. Okay, let's go back to the diagram. Q2 is not at the minimum point of average cost. And indeed, the saturation of the market with many, many different types of similar products might lead to businesses being unable to fully exploit the available comms of scale. Therefore, there might be a loss of productive efficiency. And in this market, there's also a parallel criticism that firms spend heavily on advertising and marketing and packaging. And some people argue that's both wasteful from an environmental sense, excessive packaging, and also not good from a point of view of sort of ma making full use of scarce resources, particularly if advertising effects tend to cancel each other out. However, monopoly competition can be quite good news for choice. There's a lot of choice in the market, each firm selling differentiated products. And it may also be quite good news for innovation in terms of cons businesses trying to innovate at the margin to make their products slightly better, slightly more sustainable uh, than a rival product. So dynamic efficiency could be better than imperfect competition. Monopoly, of course, is at the other extreme of the market structure spectrum, but there are different types of monopoly. So you can have a natural monopoly or pure monopoly. Uh, London Underground is close to a pure monopoly, but faces obviously competition from other forms of transport. Tesco, the supermarket industry, is effectively a working monopoly, but it's also essentially operating within a, an increasingly contestable oligopoly. Likewise, Costa, a coffee retailer, lots of thousands of small coffee retailers, but some big, big national players as well. And Pepsi and Coca-Cola, depending, depending on how we define the market, is essentially operating as two significant duopolists. Now, the monopoly diagram in the short run is essentially the same as the monopoly diagram in the long run, although in the long run you can also bring in economies of scale. So with monopoly, typically we assume that monopolists are able to use their market power to earn big, supernormal returns, shown in this diagram. The average revenue is higher than average cost and price is greater than marginal cost as well. And of course, in the long run, a monopoly is able to use barriers to entry we have a separate topic video on that on YouTube to sustain their supernormal profits into the long term. The economic case against monopoly typically is that prices are higher and output is lower than in a competitive market. On the left hand side here we see a perfectly competitive market in the long run, with the entry of new firms driving the price to P1, whereas a monopoly barriers to entry effectively preclude the entry of new products and the price can stay at a high level P2. And of course, that, leaves, that results in a loss of efficiency. So there's our supernormal profit from monopoly, but price is well above marginal cost. And as a result, you lose efficiency. There's also an additional potential efficiency loss as a result of, of, of X inefficiency. Relatively few students are taught this, but it's an important idea that if you have a, the absence of effective competition day to day in the market, then firms often allow their costs to drift higher because they don't necessarily face the stringent discipline of intense day-to-day -day competition. So there could be a degree of what's called managerial slack that businesses allow their expense accounts to get out of control or they travel and productivity suffers. And X inefficiency means that the actual average cost of production for a monopolist is higher than on their average cost boundary. There's a loss of productive efficiency there. A big debate in monopoly, of course, is the extent to which monopolies achieve economies of scale. And one of the uh, one of the aspects of this is that of a natural monopoly. A natural monopoly has falling long run average costs across the entire range of output, and marginal cost lies below average cost. Again, we have a separate topic video on this on our YouTube channel. But if you if you're a profit maximizing business, you can make a pro profit at price P1 and make a supernormal profit. But if you're forced to price at marginal cost, on the right hand side of the diagram here, particularly if, uh, if you're a nationalized industry, then if you're forced to price at marginal cost, you're going to make a loss. So there's a potential trade-off here between profitability and efficiency. 
big debate at the moment, of course, about the, the rise and rise of the so-called digital platforms, be it Google and web search, uh, WhatsApp and messaging, Amazon and e-commerce, Uber, Airbnb, Netflix, those kind of businesses. Many weren't even businesses 10, 15 years ago. It's almost now they're becoming markets and industries in their own right. And there's a question about whether they, their power, their, their scale, their rapid scale of the business is turning them into natural monopolies. What are the consequences, for example, of these businesses for economic welfare as well as for social welfare? These are important issues for the competition authorities to, to think about. So here's a quick overview. So we think about uh, monopoly. We've talked about perfect competition and monopoly competition. Of course, another aspect of market structures is contestable markets. I think this is quite an important contrast to make. So in a contestable market, any number of firms is possible. In fact, the number of firms is not the most important characteristic of a contestable market. The crucial characteristic is that the entry and exit costs are low, barriers to entry are low, and this means there's always the threat of new firms coming into the market which will impact on the behavior of existing firms and the performance of the market so whereas a monopoly may have pricing power because of barriers to entry in a contestable market the price that's charged is affected by both actual competition and crucially potential competition and what we find is that although monopoly tends to lead to less economic efficiency although good for dynamic uh, contestability should help move a market closer towards efficient outcomes. Innovation in both tens of markets tends to be quite strong. So a monopoly, innovation is a way of creating and sustaining barriers to entry, using profits, for example, to, to, to fund R&D. Whereas in a contestable market, innovation tends to be very strong because you have those kind of creatively disruptive technologies that are, are especially of new businesses looking to break into the market with a different product, or a different pricing model. Oligopoly, of course, is a, an important market structure. Here's a good example, essentially oligopolistic market in petrol retailing in the UK. Notice how the four big supermarkets in, in Britain have made substantial progress. So four of the top seven petrol retailers are now supermarkets. And in oligopoly, there are various models, including collusion, and this is the kink demand curve diagram. The kink demand curve model, again, we have a separate topic video on this on YouTube, so we won't go through the entire model now. But the kink demand curve analysis predicts that you may end up anchored at a relatively sticky price in the market once firms have anchored their price. And then non-price competition becomes a really important part of the dynamic in the long run in the market. So businesses looking to invest, looking to research, uh, engage in research and development, and other forms of non-price competition really quite significant. You can make a case for saying, actually, that an ol a contestable oligopoly is perhaps best from the point of view of dynamic efficiency because of that strength of real competition between scale businesses. Here's a quick summary of imperfect competition, the number of firms, the types of products. Crucially, from the long-run perspective, the barriers to entry are really important. So barriers to entry tend to be quite high in monopoly and oligopoly. They're much lower in the case of monopoly competition and highly contestable markets. Now, the barriers to entry dictate, in a sense, the pricing power. Obviously, regulators can get involved as well. But when barriers to entry are high, pricing power is strong. And, of course, the pricing power and barriers to, ent barriers to entry then dictate, affect the rate of profit in the long run. And this, of course, then has complications, implications for economic efficiency. So there we go. This has been a quick look at market structures in the long run. It's important to revise each in turn. We have separate topic videos on all of them on our YouTube channel. So check those out. Just search in our channel for the relevant market structure and you'll find some, some individual revision topics. The key is that the long run is really driven and determined by the barriers to entry and exit of the market and the extent to which there is flux and constant change uh, between competing businesses. Okay, thank you. I hope you found that useful and uh, look forward to joining you again sometime soon.